Thank you. Um, thanks for all of you who came out. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I spoke here a year ago, almost exactly, about this book as it was finishing up. And I actually went back and watched the video that is being recorded today to both make sure I didn't repeat myself and just to <laughs> see how it went. And in fact, it was a completely different moment. I gave a very different lecture. And so what, I, um, what I've got for you today is both to talk about this new book, which is here. You can peruse. I think they have it at bookends and beginnings, I know, or at least they did, unless they sold them out. And I also, if anyone's interested, I have a special flyer that the pub publisher made with a special discount on it, so you can get it for 30% off. Um, there you go, if anyone's interested. Um, in any case, um, this I'll talk about the book, but I'm also, I've been writing a lot around the book more recently. The book just came out in December. Um, those of you, and I know, for example, Professor Irons, who've published books, and Scott and others know that there's a, some months between the finishing of the book and the publication of the book. So I couldn't, you know, restrain myself. So I've been writing a lot about the book since it's come out, and some of, some, in, 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 you'll see that I'm trying to address, I've written a new piece for you guys. Okay, so this piece, is, um, is about the way, as the book is, the way that um, uh, American culture travels through the Middle East. And for ten, the last 10 years, as the advertisement said, I've been working on this project in essentially three sites, Morocco, in particular Casablanca, where I wrote, about which I wrote my first book and have been working on for 23 years. Uh, it feels like my second home. Um, Cairo, Egypt, and Tehran. Um, but with a bunch of trips in between to Beirut, six or seven trips to Beirut, where I thought was going to be a fourth site. So it was a very kind of impossible project to do. And it started with, a, with the problem and the paradox that I'll talk about a bit more formally, that in the past two decades, let's say, the popularity of American popular culture, literary culture, film culture, and now digital culture um, is greater and greater around the world, but especially in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, at the same time as the political reputation of the United States has been plummeting. Now in some of these places, and part of the reason I chose Tehran, which was not a place I had worked before I started the work on this book, and so I did it in a more circumscribed way, some of those places had an official kind of antipathy, let's say, to the United States, at least in official political culture, although I came to see firsthand and over several trips to Tehran that there was a great love and a familiarity with American culture at the same time. In other places, such as Egypt and Morocco, um, among the places that I was focusing on, there was a, both an official uh, alliance with and, and official love of the United States, let's say. In Morocco, as I spoke about a year ago, Moroccans regularly during the 90s when I lived in Morocco would come up to me and um, remind me, I knew it over and over again, that Morocco was the first nation to officially acknowledge the sovereignty of the United States. This was not only true, which it is, there's letters from George Washington to Sidi Mohammed bin Abdullah on display, and um, there's a treaty from 1787 signed by John Adams and Moroccan Sultan that makes this literal. Um, but it was more important from the anthropologist in me, the cultural anthropologist in me, that people wanted to tell me this. Moroccans wanted to tell a young American, then young American, that, um, that this was important to them. So, those, however, in the 2000s, as I continued to work on my first book and then that which followed and then this project, those attitudes were changing. You know, I never personally felt any um, hostility, but I could hear you know, the kinds of conversations I'd have. You would feel that the official friendships were suffering, um, certainly under, under George W. Bush administration, but even under Barack Obama. So I was interested in this paradox. That's the problem that I set out to address. What did this paradox of the popularity of American uh, culture with, a, alongside the decreasing um, fortunes of the United States as a political entity, what would that mean? And part of the reason that was interesting to me is that as a, uh, you know, I'm both an American studies scholar and a Middle East, someone who works on Middle East studies. In, in the American studies conversation, there has been a lot of, um, and let's call American studies the meeting of history and literary studies, or as one of my teachers uh, said, reading history as if it's literature and literature as if, it's, as if it's history, like in a really interesting dialectical way. One of the, one of the great topics in American studies, um, as it looked up on the Cold War, has been what the relationship was of cultural, or 
the, the um, you know, what was called the jazz ambassadors or kind of the ways in which culture, cu cultural production, cultural tours, art tours, jazz tours, literary figures traveling around Latin America during the Cold War, what that relationship was to geopolitics. So this is a topic that has a great bibliography within the Cold War, including my wife, Kate Baldwin, who teaches in this program and wrote two, has published two fabulous books about the Cold War and African Americans, uh, writers and intellectuals um, in it. A um, little plug for the program there, but I've learned a lot from her work. Um, and looking at something that follows the Cold War but has deep relationships to it, I think of the Iran-Iraq War as the last war of the Cold, the last hot war of the so-called Cold War, um, for reasons I could talk about if you want. Uh, I was interested in pursuing this. Okay, that's the kind of intellectual background to this. Now I'm going to give you this short lecture that makes it very contemporary. There are going to be two ogres in this talk. Both originate in the United States, and both of whose colorful faces, one green, one orange, circulate around the world with stunning speed and incredible reach. One emerges from popular culture and the other from political culture, or what passes for political culture in 2016, where political rallies become YouTube videos and debates are a form of entertainment with a cast of characters that even Saturday Night Live can hardly match. Two ogres, and if you didn't know better, the names would sound similar, Shrek and Trump, one with the green face, the other somewhat orange. The way they circulate through the world is remarkably similar, yet with divergent meanings. Now, I'm going to use them to make my point tonight, which is this. We need a new way to understand the global reach of American culture in the digital age. This is the premise of my new book, After the American Century, The Ends of U.S. Culture in the Middle East in which I examine how American culture moves through North Africa and the Middle East in the digital age. So let me give you the argument of the book, then Shrek, and then the orange ogre. By the way, Amy and Scott, who were here a year ago, I talked about Shrek in Morocco, and I'm going to talk about Shrek in Iran a little bit today. Shrek is one of the key figures in my book. <clears throat> I, I argue in the book that because of the way that circular culture circulates in the digital age and the changed geopolitical status of the United States in the 21st century, we have entered a period after the American century. By this I mean that American culture and cultural products, long popular globally and assumed to have a positive message or benefit to United States politics, are generally taken up by individuals in ways that detach the cultural products from their American referent, and that this shatters the presumption of their close relationship. That presumption is one that I attach to Henry Luce's 1941 essay, The American Century, and which underlies much cultural diplomacy through the Cold War and to the present. In the book, I highlight a series of cases from North Africa and the Middle East, especially Cairo, Casablanca, and Tehran, where I did the bulk of my research, and I look at debates over movies in Iran and Morocco, censored Egyptian comics and cyberpunk fiction, the huge impact of YouTube, uh, and social networking software in the region. American cultural products, all of them, par excellence. And I try to make sense of the fragmented meanings that American cultural objects and forms now take in new and frequently unpredicted locations. In so doing, I'm trying to, uh, to, to map out what the period after the American century looks like, and not just for the sake of cultural criticism. As I'll argue, we need to take much more seriously the role that understanding culture plays in geopolitics. As I started the research a decade ago, I was interested in the following paradox. U.S. hegemony is in decline politically and economically, but the products of American culture are ubiquitous. In the wake of the acts of September 11, 2001, New York Times cultural critic Alan Riding had suggested that the United States should, quote, rerun our Cold War cultural diplomacy. And the State Department quickly did so, ramping up cultural diplomacy to bring cultural events and music festivals to countries such as Morocco and Egypt, and across the airwaves radio, via the new Radio Sawa, broadcasting local Arabic dialects, Radio Farda in Persian, and satellite TV stations such as El Hura in Arabic. But many of these products and events lacked the subtlety of Cold War era cultural programming. Whereas the famous Porgy and Bess tour in Moscow in 1955 brought an acclaimed theatrical production to the Soviets, 
The Friendship Fest in Marrakesh in 2005, sponsored by the state, brought Christian rock to Muslim audiences in a way that forced local populations to confront the exporting nation's explicit politics. <clears throat> As Secretary of State Hillary Clinton put it in 2011, commenting on the state-sponsored tour to Damascus of hip-hop artist Chan Lo and the Liberation Family, this is Secretary Clinton, quote, hip-hop is America. I think we have to use every tool at our disposal. And she went on to say, you have to bet at the end of the day that people will choose freedom over tyranny, and she's addressing this hip-hop tour when she's saying this, that people will choose freedom over tyranny if they're given a choice. She went on to call cultural diplomacy a complex game of, quote, multi-dimensional chess. Now, Clinton's comments not only make visible the ways in which the U.S. state has mobilized American culture, especially African-American culture, but also suggest a papering over of the more uncomfortable U.S. political acts. As Hisham Aidi commented on news network Al Jazeera's website at the time, despite the fact that rap, quote, provided a soundtrack to the North African revolts, the role of hip-hop should not be exaggerated. Aid pointed to the ways in which authoritarian states such as Tunisia under Ben Ali and Syria under Bashar al-Assad um, had mobilized hip-hop with Western support, being so as being used on both sides, let's say. Now, my early sense was that such projects do more harm than good by their assumption of a unified Muslim world that needed to be persuaded of America's good and goodwill and tolerance uh, even while news reports through the decade challenged that glossy view. What once were autonomous cultural products now carried with them the taint of American politics. And this taint extended beyond explicit American cultural exports. In 2002, a large-scale boycott of American products took off in the Arab world. At times, the limits of what counted as American um, became vague an ambiguity that took on comic proportions when a Saudi business owner of a popular donut chain, House of Donuts, which had 150 franchises, who worried about the impact of the boycott on his, on his business, he publicly offered $300,000 to anyone who could pr prove that his two-decade-old business had any American ties. In fact, he had this campaign, <laughs> this is not a joke, I mean, it is funny, but Mr. Donut is an Arab was his billboard. <laughs> Um, and the idea, I mean, it's silly, it was a donut, um, but the idea here is that for many, the donut was an American thing. How could you be selling a donut and not be somehow American? You know, if you go to Paris and you see the, what do they call muffins? Les moufins, you know, like these things that become associated with um, America because it's what I would call a cultural form, a donut. Or, you know, so. Anyway, but as silly as the House of Donuts challenge was, the man had a point. Why boycott a Saudi donut? Can a donut be Saudi? Is Moroccan hip-hop or any of the global hip-hops out there American? Let's talk about Shrek. During the years I was researching this book, I kept coming across Shrek in the most unlikely of places. On the streets of Tehran, in the souk of the old Medina of Rabat, there he was. But what was it that I was seeing? Here's a scene from the book. Downtown Tehran, February 2009. Impossible traffic. The energy of nine million Iranians making their way through congested streets, the white peaks of the Alborz Mountains disappearing shade by shade in the ever-increasing smog. The government had declared another pollution emergency, and the city center is closed to license plates ending in odd and even numbers on alternate days. The students at the university where I was teaching a graduate seminar in American studies are complaining openly about the failures of their elected officials. Nahal and I are sitting in a cafe off Haftetir Square. She is smart and dynamic, a graduate student and a freelance journalist who is quick to criticize the U.S. government and the perfidy of CNN. When I mentioned that a few days earlier I had overheard Friday prayers from my apartment and was taken aback by the shouting, by the chanting of the phrase Marg Bar America, death to America, she quickly retorts, but you call us the axis of evil. Our conversation turns to the movie Shrek. I've insisted on tracking down dubbed versions of Shrek, even though I didn't come to Iran planning to do so. I had actually come on this trip interested in figuring out what Iranians really thought and say about Abbas Kiarostami, 
the Iranian film director with the greatest global circulation, celebrated in Cannes and Chicago alike, but raising awkward feelings in Iran. Was his global celebrity a reason to be wary of him? Was he, was he kowtowing to the West? Now, Iran is a place where film matters greatly. At the kiosks in Tehran, you could find multiple film dailies on the newsstands and multiple magazines about the movies. Later, the nation would be riveted to the Academy Awards to see if Asghar Farhadi would win the first ever Oscar from Iran. He did when A Separation won Best Foreign Language Film at the 2012 Academy Awards. I talk about the film and its complicated reception quite a bit in the book. Then, a year later, when Ben Affleck's political suspense film Argo took home the 2013 Oscar from Best Picture, there was a general dismay, particularly about the film's repre representation of Iranians and recent history. The Islamic Republic promised to fund a remake. The Iranian government retained a French lawyer to sue Ben Affleck in international court. And two academic conferences held in Tehran about Hollywood's Iranophobia garnered international press coverage. And I talked about Ben Affleck a year ago, so I won't tell you anything more about him here. But as I engaged with an ever-increasing circle of people in Iran's film worlds, I was stuck by how ubiquitous pirated versions of Shrek and other CGI Hollywood films, CGI, the computer-generated illustration films like Shrek and others that use the, that technology to make this impossibly lush kind of visual experience. Not that anyone said so, but many in Iran resisted my interpretation, though the evidence seemed overwhelming to me. The image of Shrek, it was, seemed everywhere in Tehran, painted on the walls of DVD shops and electronic shops, featured in this elaborate mural, in fact, a whole play space in the prominent mall in North Tehran called Jamejam Mall. Um, once I was in a car in downtown Tehran and I passed a five-foot Shrek mannequin on the sidewalk, and like his fellow pedestrians, he had a surgical face mask to protect him from the smog, which people were wearing. In fact, that smog was immense. I mean, I've lived in Moscow and come home to have, be unable to breathe because of what my body did to protect. I had daily headaches in Tehran. It was crystal clear in the smog. The Alborz Mountains just contain the smog in a way that's hard to describe, except that you instantly have a massive headache. And I never get headaches. And it's like, wow. Nahal admits, my... Uh, graduate student friend here, and Nahal admits that, my, that she thinks my fascination with Shrek is unusual. <laughs> Together we have been shopping for copies of the various Farsi dubbed versions of Shrek, in particular the elusive illegal versions that I was interested in, in downtown supermarkets, in small DVD stalls on Kargar Street or Angalab Square, in shopping malls in the elite North Tehran, and in the markets of grimy South Tehran, we inquire and follow various pathways, many of them dead ends. Why Shrek, she asks me. Well, I ask her, how many times have you seen the film? Oh, not that many, she tells me. 36, 37 times. <laughs> not like most people. <laughs> now, Hal explained to me, you see, it's not really the original Shrek that we love so much here. It's really the dubbing. It's more the Iranian Shrek that interests us. The Iranian film industry has a long and illustrious tradition of high-quality dubbings. In the post-revolution era and with the ensuing rise of censorship, dubbing has evolved to become a form of underground art, as well as a meta-commentary on Iranians' attempt to adapt and in some ways lay claim to the products of Western culture. A single American film such as Shrek inspires multiple dubbed versions, some illegal by local standards and some not, causing Iranians to discuss and debate which of the many Farsi Shreks is superior. I go into a shop. Kenna, do you have a copy of Shrek? Which Shrek? I don't know. Shrek 1. I don't care. No, which Shrek 1 do you want? You know, then they would describe this one or that one. I'd say, I want the illegal. We don't have the illegal one. You know, now why would it be illegal? And say, we have nothing illegal in this shop. I say, the entire shop is illegal. <laughs> because all of this is pirated from paying no, you know, Iran's not participating in U.S. copyright or international copyright. And they're very elaborate covers and you can buy any film. You see, but illegal in this context means something more local because there's these locally illegal versions. The donkey in one, for example, has a Rashti accent. Now, Bill may laugh at you guys may laugh, the Irons may laugh at this, but 
Most people, when I say that, have no idea what I'm talking about. A Rashti accent has, has connotes all sorts of things to Iranians because it's particularly there's jokes about the Rashti, right? Uh, and see, we have crickets, and that's what I like. Actually, I'm really interested in what I call the ends of cultural circulation, where it, Shrek is no longer familiar to you once you start div diving into an Iranian Shrek, for example. In some author unauthorized versions, which are much more difficult to find, various regional and ethnic dialects are paired with the diverse characters of Shrek, the stereotypes associated with each accent adding an additional level of humor for Iranians. In the more risque bootlegs, obscene or off-topic conversations are transposed over Shrek's fairy tale shenanigans. Jokes, Shrek, Zareshk. Now you, Zareshk is a berry, and Zareshk Polo is a famous Iranian dish. There's lots of puns in one. We, were, we went through these and we, we listened to them with the, uh, and these puns over the, the words that would sometimes move in and out of English, for example. So I asked Nahal back the question she asked me, why Shrek of all things? Or why more generally are Iranians so taken with American CGI films coming out of studios such as DreamWorks and Pixar? Is it the racially coded weirdness of Shrek's cast of characters that somehow speaks to Iranians? Does Shrek himself symbolize the repressed id of a people living under a sexually censorious society? These are things that have been suggested to me. No, I think in both cases. Or are Iranians simply attracted to the impossible lushness and tactile pleasures of American CGI technology itself? Something closer to that. But Nahal finds my questions behind the, beside the point. Our Shrek, she tells me, isn't an American film at all. We are watching the Iranian Shrek. The title of my talk refers to some time, or the, of my book, of some time after the American century, as if an historical period is over. And yet to many, it seems that we are surrounded by, overwhelmed by, the continuation of an American militarism associated with the phrase, resonating from the rise of the U.S. to superpower, to superpower status with the end of World War II, through the Cold War with its many hot spells, into a muscular period since September 11th, and now extending into a yet more violent future. The campaign slogan of former Republican presidential candidate Marco Rubio called for a new American century. Are you ready for a new American century? He used to ask from the stage, I used to last month, you know, and invoked a, a neoconservative vision of what that means. In a discussion at the Council on Foreign Relations in 2015, Rubio explained what he meant. Quote, we must recognize that our nation is a global leader, not simply because it has superior arms, but be also because it has superior aims. America is the first power in history motivated by a desire to expand freedom rather than simply expand its own territory." End of quote. It's chilling to me. I mean, we never heard that chilling side of Rubio. We got caught up in sex jokes about Trump, you know, but it's chilling. This desire to expand freedom has come at a cost. As the past dozen years since the invasion and occupation of Iraq in the name of freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom, the official name of the War on Terror from 2001 to 2014, followed in Afghanistan by Operation Freedom's Sentinel, and of course Operation Iraqi Freedom, 2003 to 2010. The unintended consequence of this expansion of America's freedoms, the export of American exceptionalism, has led to the rise of one of the most restrictive forces in the recent history of the Middle East, ISIS or Daesh. This is a point made by both left and now reluctantly by the right. In the most recent issue, actually one has just come out, um, this penultimate issue of the most much respected quarterly Middle East report, otherwise known as Merip, the editors give a nuanced rise of a, nu a nuanced account of the rise of ISIS, its multiple points of origin, America's obsession with ISIS when the majority of the victims of ISIS's violence are Muslims, and most of those engaging ISIS on the battlefield are Muslims as well. It's a very kind of sane a take on, on ISIS. But then they write quite starkly, quote, there would be no ISIS had there been no U.S. invasion of Iraq. Simply put. Donald Trump, the Republican frontrunner still, essentially agreed with the Middle East report. In South Carolina, a Republican voter at a televised town hall stood up and gave Trump the chance to recant his accusation that George W. Bush had lied to the American public in going into Iraq, which he called, Trump called, the worst decision. Um, but Trump also vows to, quote, knock the hell out of ISIS, and his America, Make America Great Again slogan resonates with the logics of the American century. 
I wrote a piece in uh, Salon in December, uh, as I reported in Salon in December. I was in Fez lecturing to university students this fall when the news broke that Donald Trump had called for an immediate halt to Muslims entering the United States. And in order to contextualize the Republican candidate's strange ascendancy in presidential politics, I started explaining to young Moroccans how Trump had gotten to the position of prominence and his role in reality television. The students were way ahead of me. Most of them had seen this. Is, they cut me off. Celebrity Apprentice, we know. <laughs> With satellite television and the internet, the circulation of culture and news, particularly bad news, is accelerated exponentially. By telling ourselves that Trump's comments are extreme and that their global impact can be countered by public disavowals or by a democratic victory, as many Americans believe, we are deluding ourselves. To young Moroccans, whose country is 99 point something percent Muslim and long friendly to the United States, Trump's anti-Muslim comments were the latest sign that American culture has become increasingly hateful toward them. The global effects of speech such as Mr. Trump's are profound here and will be long lasting. So what would it mean to speak of a period after the American century in this context? What does it mean to suggest that we are at some point after that? The phrase, which publisher Henry Luce famously used as the title of his editorial in Life magazine in February 1941, was always less about a period of time than more, and, and more about a, a lot than, than a logic of how culture moves through the world. The American century, as Luce defined it, is a hugely influential theory of what the relationship of culture and cultural production is to geopolitics, I think. In the digital age, cultural products move, more, move differently and are taken up by audiences in the Middle East, North Africa, and around the world in ways that shatter the logic of the American century, as Luce had it. And the ways in which, Luce, and the ways in which culture moves through the world in the digital age shows that there's a dif different relationship of culture to contemporary politics than during the 20th century. It is urgent for us to understand how American culture moves through the world then in the digital age, which is part of why I'm interested in silly things such as Shrek. The devastating acts of murder and violence in France late last year targeted a rock concert, a soccer match, and cafes in Paris's dynamic 10th arrondissement. Earlier the same year, a satirical magazine, most famous for its cartoons, was attacked. The sites where these terrible crimes took place were not simply gathering places. They were locations where people go to consume or produce culture. In the general hysteria of our times, we tend to reduce cultural products and their consumption to simple rather than complex things. Rushing to keep up with an ever more dire geopolitical landscape, an easy binarism prevails, us versus them, civilization versus barbarism. Paris becomes simply the romantic city of lights under attack the debate over Charlie Hebdo, a simple question of freedom of speech. But this replaces a more nuanced sense of how culture is both contested and how cultural products can offer a window onto the complexities of life in various places in the planet during a time of global transformation. Many analysts of foreign affairs tend to relegate understanding culture as irrelevant to the hard work of political science and international relations. The humanities and humanistic social sciences, such as cultural anthropology, are all well and good from this perspective, but secondary when it comes to understanding or negotiating international relations. I am con increasingly convinced that this is an error and a costly one. Cultural products and debates over them help explain the world we live in with a nuance that is missing from those formulas in social science or the distant perspective of media talking heads. When I read or listen to accounts of the great and ancient tensions between Sunni and Shia, or analysts who chart the national rivalries between states like a giant game of risk or a game of multidimensional chess. Um, I feel that the discussion is too abstract and fails to reflect the realities as I have come to understand them based on more than two decades of discussions with people in the Middle East and North Africa. Three or four years ago, I had a get to know you meeting with the head of a prominent, prominent Middle East think tank that was set up for me and I told him about my work trying to understand the relationship between cultural products and politics. Very nice, he said. My wife is interested in culture. 
the gendered or misogynistic comment was meant to be dismissive. Culture doesn't matter to men's work. The meeting didn't last much longer. <laughs> the perils of not attending to the realm of culture are significant, especially because political scientists have no greater purchase on predicting actual outcomes and future developments than those who attend to culture. In my most recent trip back, I noticed he's no longer in that job. Um, in the summer of 2011, Foreign Affairs ran a story entitled, Why Middle East Studies Missed the Arab Spring. With its title splashed across the influential magazine's cover, the implication was that academia had once again blown it and had little to offer practitioners. Uh, but the author of the article himself, a political scientist, so neatly circumscribed the field of Middle East studies as political science that readers might be excused for thinking that no other disciplines pertain to this interdisciplinary field. In cultural anthropology and literary studies of contemporary Egypt in those same years, much richer discussions had been taking place where the sense of bubbling frustration and revolutionary recklessness among Egyptians were quite visible. But cultural studies, unlike the brand of political science referred to in the Foreign Affairs essay, doesn't consider predicting the future to be its business. So what can someone trained in to do readings of literary texts and other cultural products offer to discussions in such lofty fields as, as international relations? I contend that attention to culture, by which I mean close attention to cultural products as forms of expression and contests over consumption of them, is crucial both to understanding relationships between the US and the Middle East and North Africa and to finding a way out of the ever widening gap of misunderstanding. Now there are two tactics here. First, paying attention to what I call contests over culture means focusing on the public discussions of cultural products as they are consumed, debates, protests, and, di and disagreements. Many films and, novels around, um, many films and novels enter the world as social events. Big budget Hollywood movies and low budget shorts circulated on the internet can stir passions. Um, in After the American Century, I discuss both the Iranian response to Ben Affleck's film Argo, which to most Iranians was a slap in the face, and the global protests and outrage over the low budget YouTube video Innocence of Muslims made in Southern California by a former pornographer, which led to a kind of wave of global protests. I could, if you don't remember that, I'll remind you later. Films, novels, and comics from the Middle East and North Africa can frequently provoke vigorous debates in the region, but, um, and these debates are highly revealing. We are all consumers of culture, whatever we do in our day jobs. Understanding the cultural products that animate people in whatever context they're living in is the first step to understanding the world we live in with subtlety, and doing so just might allow us to move away from the binarisms and formulas that explain little against themselves. Thank you. I decided to cut the last section, which goes into, but uh, just to say what was in there, because um, I could see that we could get into a discussion, and I'll um, uh, to say what's in there is so I start to talk about a little bit of the history of public diplomacy, or what's called cultural diplomacy, about which I'm happy to talk about its own kind of field within, um, within uh, the State Department and so on. But anyway, thank you. Hi. Uh, so your presentation really resonated with me um, on a number of levels, mostly because this whole idea of cultural diplomacy, of intercultural uh, exchange is something that I'm personally very fascinated about, so what I like to write about. But just speaking from my perspective, like I've always been sort of the person to say that I grew up in a generation that was raised by Japanese anime and Swedish death metal. Mm -hmm. Like I can, yeah. I can distinctly remember the point where, as a child, like in the early '90s, I went from watching things like the Pink Panther and Captain America to literally my most resonant initial like multicultural experience was watching an episode of Dragon Ball Z dubbed in Spanish mm -hmm. for the Spanish channel and trying to intuit the meaning behind that. And as I went on, it was like it just became more and more resonant in that I saw this confluence of things that weren't necessarily American made, right. but still kind of like found their way proliferating through intertextuality throughout the entire spectrum of, of American media. And when you're talking about how the rise of like American media has never been higher, but at the same time our our cultural, like our inter our, our, our interpolitical like reputation is kind of like tanking at the same time, I can't help but think of 
the rise of almost like superhero films because in my mind they've always been sort of analogous, at least this recent era at least, have been analogous to uh, American attitudes towards interventionalism or even the use of like drone warfare. We've gone from like Spider-Man working as a domestic interventionalist like helping stop the bad guys in New York where we have films like Batman v Superman where Superman is literally going to different countries and basically like acting under the auspices of I'm going to free these people from themselves, mm. whether they like it or not. And that echoes this That's whole, not <laughs> It's terrifying. It's, it's, the, it's the exact same idea of this whole American century mentality of like going in and trying to, and trying and, and, and doing this operation enduring freedom. Like that chills me to the bone. Like whose freedom? Like whose freedom is enduring? Because so much, it, it, it's something that, it's the elephant in the room that, much of the things, the conveniences that we have and the, the comforts that we have are often built at the expense of other people whom that we may never see and their plights we may never know until they, they're, 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 they're immediately in front of us, unless they're brought to the attention of like a, an earthquake and hate or something like that. It's, it's, um, it's really fascinating. But yeah, I mean, I yeah. Well, yeah, it's a great comment and uh, it's, uh, you know, just to touch on some of the things you touched, you, know, you mentioned. On the one hand, if you think about this, you have this example from the Superman, this new movie, which I actually haven't seen Don't yet. Don't go see it. But, um, <laughs> but I've, you know, I've, been fa I've been long fascinated with and written about Star Wars for a lot of reasons. Yes, yeah. Not only could I call it like a late hippie orientalism or post-hippie orientalism, and been really interested in its relationship to Tunisia. I traveled with my kids all through North Africa, tracking down the shooting sites, and then wrote about it. And because um, I'm convinced it gave, you know, um, my generation, um, a, 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 with you know, coming out of the, with the Iranian Revolution, and then after that, a kind of look, a desert look of an imagined kind of foe that was the past, but really the future, and mm -hmm. so on. Um, but if you take a movie like Star Wars or some of these superhero films, of course, in so many of them, on the one hand, they clearly reflect some of the ideas of their writers or their producers. And the Star Wars movies that came out during the 2000s very famously kind of reflected George Lucas's kind of, you know, ideas about George Bush when Darth Vader says something, you know, you're with us or against us at one moment, or Anakin Skywalker says that. There's also Clearly like a reflection of something, right? So what did literary critics, sorry, I don't mean to, but what did literary critics or cultural critics do with tech products like that? Well, it seemed to reflect a moment. If you imagine looking at Star Wars 50 years from now, you'd say, oh, that was a, an opinion that some people had, on the one hand. On the other hand, or, you know, uh, uh, twisting a little bit, they also are myths by which, or the more powerful ones, are ways in which as I say, we're all consumers of culture, whatever we do in our day jobs. That includes military generals and politicians and people who actually make policy and those of us who vote for those people or don't vote for them. You know, they create kind of mythologies, national narratives, we would call them, in some interesting kind of knotted way that allow us to make sense of an otherwise very messy reality. Reality is always messy. You know, the great war journalist and food critic, A.J. Liebling, um, who I wrote about in my first book, who wrote for The New Yorker in the, for decades, had a phrase when he tried to cover nor the North African campaign in World War II, you know, that confusion is normal in conduct. You would think that people on the ground in a war would be the ones who understand what's going on, but of course they don't. We need, we, we in the middle of a very what, a historical presidential campaign, which well, we do know, even it ends up in the now four to four Supreme Court, <laughs> um, Right, that this is an interesting, strange historical moment. We don't know what's going on. Right? It's where even those of us who are following it, right? So how, and so therefore, narratives, competing narratives, help us make sense of what's going on in yeah. various sorts of ways. That's the kind of contest over which narrative will prevail. And superhero films and Star Wars and and novels that are effective, like reading Lolita in Tehran, is a, not a novel, but a work about reading of novels, which was hugely influential and had a point to make about that, these become more useful than purely, oh, my wife is interested in culture, you know. Now, when Bill Clinton says that about President Clinton, it would mean something different than this guy meant, by the way, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but let me get you, yeah, well, I don't, we'll have it as a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I found your, you know, your talk very, very interesting. Thank you. 
I'm, I guess, from an older generation. So, so it happens. Um, when I think of the term culture, as I understood it, as I grew up with it, uh, I would have differentiated popular culture from culture. Right. Okay. When I look at what has evolved in the last 20, 30 years or so, I see three elements that make it very, very complex and confusing. One is the diversity. So many different styles, trends, etc. Another is the rate of change and the time that it might take to become expert in one form, one manifestation of culture, whether it be right. hip hop or you know, I don't know, uh, rap or something. Snapchat video conversations. And it's gone <laughs> or it's reduced. Or, wait, yeah, Snapchat, 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 stories. Snapchat stories. I don't even have a look at that. <laughs> and, then the, and the third thing, either, to my mind, that comes to mind, is the amplification. Because of media, as it has developed, because of technology, we get an overwhelming mm -hmm. wave, if you will, of this stuff. So it's yeah. it's cross-sectionally complex, a lot of different things. It's very loud, if I can use that as kind of a metaphor, and it keeps changing. Now, right. <clears throat> you've undertaken a tremendously difficult task in trying to analyze, interpret, and whatever, yet what this stuff called American culture, as it yeah. now exists, right. what sure. role can that play, will that play, does that play, in the Middle East, as well as any other part of the world. So I commend you for oh, your Oh, thank you. I mean, you're right, but it's, it's really interesting. I mean, as a, one of the things that I'm really interested in, and you know, when I teach classes in this program is, and even this class I taught at University of Tehran, was about what would the methodologies be of, right, of analyzing, understanding the ever-changing present. It's a very impossible task, right? And when you, you give a good description of culture, I'd love to, you know, say something about that and all that it is and includes and, and how it's ever re changing. Um, and it's true, it's dizzying even for very young people, the dizzying for our own, for my own children from whom, you know, we, we learn a lot because it's ever changing. But that's the rule of, that's the, that's, it's fluid. <laughs> and that's the, that's the rule of the game so that you're right. There's a kind of, from a methodological or kind of the, the scholarly side of me, um, tries to grapple with that impossible task because even as you're describing, like I'm noticing I'm using the past tense on purpose, you know, Marco, Marco Rubio, it's, it, everything is the ever receding past and when you think about cultural products. Now one of the things I didn't talk about a lot in this talk but is deeply informs the book is that I'm fascinated in the relationship of uh, technology and, and re technological revolution to this question. A, a huge motivation in, in what I've called, in, what I refer to as a period after the American century, or really not a period, but what I call an epistemology after the American century, a way of thinking of how we are in the world, is the relationship of technology to how we engage with, um, with culture, Let's, I'll come back to that word, and with each other. Uh, and how quickly that is changing. We're obviously in a very much of a revolutionary, a technological revolution. I believe actually, you know, uh, not seen since the late 18th century. And this is also a moment of major political transformation. Um, it's not, it's no, it's not particularly unique to say, well, it's somewhat, it's not mainstream to say that the, these technologies themselves have had as much to do with this hard to define 20 years since the end of the Cold War, 25 years since the end of the Cold War, that has been so violent and so fractured and so changing. Um, and so, you know, even in the space of uh, writing a book about the present moment, so to speak, 10, 10 years, the technology of when I started this thing, you know, is utterly defunct and out of, and, and if you do ever see a movie, I always love when you see movies, recent movies, movies five years old, ten years old, in which there's a computer or someone doing email, right? It could be from last year and it looks so quaint, right? Even we know as we buy whatever iPhone number we're buying that it's already, 
going to be useless by the time of that two-year plan <laughs> expires. <laughs> right? um, and there's something to be said then about, so why does that matter? Now, within the field of media studies, sorry for a long, this, I don't mean to do such a long answer, but in the field of media studies is really about which Scott knows a ton. I would love to hear what he thinks about this. But there's a really interesting debate uh, always about what the relationship is of these forms to the content itself. So if we say, oh, there's this thing happens in Star Wars or Superman or in Shakespeare or Faulkner, right? And I'm actually I'm not equating those, but in this, in this sense I am. We would really care about the media through which, I mean, it matters that Shakespeare is on a stage and every time Shakespeare refers to the, to the globe or the world or the O, oh, he's also, we know he's in a theater that's round that's called the globe, and, you know, these, and that he's speaking, you know, that's old school stuff, right? That he's speaking to the, to a range of social classes, that all of that techno, all of the sort of the media is very important to even the most traditional of high cultural forms. It absolutely matters to cinema, to, you know, as I'm saying, these new forms that we don't yet analyze, cell phone videos, right? There are film festivals for cell phone made movies now and photograph photography shows and so on. Um, so what is that kind of interest? You know, if the technologies are changing at such a rapid, you know, beyond what we can all imagine, what does that mean to the engagement with these, these cultural products? The last thing I want to say, because you raised, it, you raised the term culture, which any anthropologist, I have a great anthropologist in the room, and I'm sure others, I just don't know, or don't recognize. Um, it's a word that you, you don't like to use with anthropologists in the room, so without qualifying in some way. The great Raymond Williams, um, uh, British literary critic and one of the inventors of so-called cultural studies, let's say, has a great, wonderful book called Keywords, uh, in which he looks at the ways in which certain words came into English usage interesting words like culture and he, t he teaches us that this idea what you said culture or high culture and um, a throat culture <laughs> are actually very much the same come from the same usage which is that when you created a throat culture or a back growing bacteria you were grow you were in cultivating crops you this word from cultivating is where culture comes from when people started to think that they needed to cultivate children um, and a generation and to raise them in a certain way, the idea that would eventually be described by Matthew Arnold, snobbish critic that he was, as culture as the best and greatest that has been said by men and women, Shakespeare, opera, right? Do you see how they come? Now, for an anthropologist, culture has you know, been defined in any number of ways. I like Clifford Gertz's riff on um, Max Weber, which is that culture is winks upon winks upon winks, which is these webs of signification mm -hmm. that an anthropologist needs to have such a sensitivity to their environment, language, history, and so on, that they understand the difference between a wink and a blink. That's the Gertzian thing. Do you know when someone's winking at you when they're just blinking with a twitch? <laughs> to understand the difference in the right context is to understand those webs of signification, which is for a Gertzian kind of, sorry, you know, now we get the prep, well, engaged anthropologist now. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> sorry, we have long answers, I don't mean to. <laughs> I have 15 second answers too, Just in the back. Yeah. You know, I, this is a simpler question, but I remember the Iranian takeover of the U.S. Embassy very vividly, watching it on the news and, and so forth. And I also saw the movie Argo. And it, as near as I could tell, it was a fairly accurate representation. I mean, I wasn't with uh, the Ben Affleck character in the movie or in the Canadian embassy or anything. Right. But what, what was it that the Iranians it's a great, were yeah. offended by? Well, it's very interesting, first of all. The, the film itself is very interesting because if you recall, and by the way, I was born in 1968, so I remember as an 11-year-old you know, something about this. I remember some, two things about the Iran hostage crisis, that it was happening, all the yellow ribbons, my mom telling me, waking me up one morning and saying, President Carter tried to, it was the helicopter crash, that whole thing. I also remember the Iranian girl in my middle school who was just in Greenwich, Connecticut, in a very elite place like Winnetka, right? Who was just given hell by every kid who didn't know anything about Iran, so much so that she left the school. So I remember that too. Um, in any case, um, the, it, Ben Affleck's film is very interesting because it, the, the, if you recall, it begins with a prologue, kind of a historical prologue, 
that tells us, it's a storybook and tells a story of the Shah. It gives a little mini capsule history of the U.S. involvement in Iran that would seem to someone who's followed it to be a little bit on the left, a little bit further on the left than you would expect from a Hollywood film. It is the kind of generally accepted case now that the U.S. was, the CIA was involved in the overthrow of Mohammad Mossadegh, the democratically elected prime minister, which every Iranian of my age and younger knows, even though I don't know any non-academic of my generation or young who's ever heard of Mohammed Mossadegh until Ben Affleck's film, actually. <laughs> right? I mean, this is part of the thing you tell us, you know, you call us the axis of evil and you, you're complaining that we say death to America. You understand? You know, do you know it? What does 1953 mean to you? I had heard so many times from, try to say that to an American kid. Um, so, he starts, Ben Affleck starts this very interesting kind of account of the, it's a historical background to, to the, uh, the students taking over the, the embassy that seemed a bit to the left, actually. I mean, eventually, under President Clinton, we officially acknowledged that we had a role, that the U.S. had a role through Madeleine Albright. It was officially, finally, in 2000, acknowledged that, yes, in fact, the U.S. had had a role in the overthrow of Mossadegh. Stephen Kinzer, our neighbor here in Northwestern faculty, has written a wonderful book, Popular History, All the Shah's Men, that tells this story quite well. But then the film itself, which is based on, um, if, you don't, if you haven't seen the film, it's based on a, historically, a historical case where um, a bunch of Americans who kind of escaped out a side door and ended up in the residence of the Canadian ambassador, um, and the CIA sent a, an agent, a real guy, who to ex, for extradition, is that the word they use, to extra, extrapolate them, whatever the technical word of extrapolate is. Was that the word? Yeah. Anyway, to take them. Extricate, yeah, there's some, there's some. Uh, and they got some, yeah, we got that. <laughs> it's that extra. Um, and he helped them get out. And actually, now everything, and so that, that was all true, except that everything, and I'm not going to complain about what's actually true, and some of the Iranians were upset, but everything that happens in the movie once Ben Affleck's character gets to Iran is completely fabricated the, um, in, in its details. It gets, you know, and what's, it goes back to your question about kind of hero narratives. It becomes a story of this heroic CIA agent kind of extricating these Americans from this Canadian embassy to the point where literally people are running down a runway with guns drawn, none of which happened at all. It becomes a whole kind of 1970s Dukes of Hazard episode, I always think, because they're like running, you know, and, and, and the plane takes off just as they're, you know, none of that was in the case. Now, that's not especially what bothered the Iranians. That part bothered the Canadians, <laughs> who are furious about the movie, because actually it's a great thing in Canadian history. This sort of special se uh, session of parliament or whatever that created fake Canadian passports that, that allowed the Americans to get out, and it's kind of legendary in Canada, and all of that was written out. So the, the historical figure, which is strange, not because, you know, you say, oh, who cares? Because if you, Ben Affleck went to such lengths to what, do what he called in the DVD release photographic realism or something, where he cast all of these characters, none of whom, you don't know, those, those people were not famous. Mm -hmm. But he, you, then they, at the end of the movie, they show pictures of the real people. And he made everyone look exactly like what they looked like. He reconstructed scenes. I thought the airport in Tehran was the airport in Tehran it, because he did so much detail. And yet, so, and, and then it, in the, D, the DVD release, when they have all the little features, he has these interviews where he talks about having been a Middle East studies major in college and having read everything about the Iran thing. I looked it up because I was curious. I thought, oh, he's... He went to one semester of college before he dropped out, which is, no, it's true. And he, but in these days, I was a Middle East Studies major in college. I read everything on it. So there's this really interesting kind of thing about I'm writing history. And it goes to this kind of very heroic narrative. The Iranians were upset because every time Iranian characters show up in the movie, they're, they are perceived, they're, they don't, the whole Iranian side of that story, the debate about it, the feelings about the students, there was a protest, there was... It was not a simple thing in Iran, the, or the memory of it. They're kind of reduced to like beating on cars and kind of... And anytime Persian is spoken, with one exception, you, there's no subtitles. It's all just kind of noise within the system. So there was a lot, you know... And it's interesting, because both, uh, both within the political spectrum in Iran, 
There are people who love Hollywood films, who, who are very critical of the government in Iran, and those who are pro the government. Across the board, people did not like this movie. Mm -hmm. Very interesting in that sense. Um, and so kind of Affleck's, you know, kind of pose as a leftist kind of critic was very much mis apprehended and, you know, not appreciated in Iran. Of course, it's not, and it's, and it's, it's, there's any number of films you will remember, Not Without My Daughter, the, the film that was a sh loathed in Iran because it told a similarly, um, you know, aggressive and simplifying version where all Iran is kind of simple brutes. This is a very civilized, very deeply educated society. Of course, there's a range of political, you know, things that one could say, but this idea that this was just kind of a reductionist, uh, thing. One other thing to say about Argo, which is just too crazy for words in a way, is that when I used to, when I spent some time in Iran, I would teach film, I didn't talk about what I actually taught, but we had once had a discussion with these graduate students in which, um, which some graduate students were criticizing another liberal, another film made Hollywood film, Babel, by uh, Inyaratu, um, who, which, which the Iranian students thought was very hostile to Muslims. And at the time I was surprised uh, by their reading of the film and I came to understand what, what they meant by that. And uh, this is during George Bush's administration when that film came out. I won't go into the details of that film. Um, but one student said to me, you know, Hollywood is like, is working with Bush in a kind of conspiracy theory sort of way. And I said, well, actually you have to understand, you know, during this Bush administration, which is when this conversation happened, Hollywood is very against the current political... Uh, he said, no, no, you don't understand, the student said to me, that in fact Hollywood is working for the Bush administration and the Hollywood and the U.S. government are in cahoots. And CNN too. And I said, no, that's stretching it too far. Um, I said, you know, anyway, without going into the further discussion, when Argo was awarded the Academy Award, Iran was watching this. Um, I don't know if you remember that many of the films that year were very violent and very political. Zero Dark Thirty was imagined to be the front runner until people started to pr criticize um, uh, Catherine Bigelow was it, um, for being, they thought, too sympathetic to, to, to the use of torture in, the, in Iraq. And it dropped at the last minute. It was probably would have won, but the last minute it didn't win. Anyway, you know how it is, the Academy Awards are on stage in Hollywood and then they say, and then the winner is, right? For the awarding the best picture of that film, a strange and, to my memory, unique thing happened, which is the hosts on stage said, and now for the awarding of the Academy Award for Best Picture, we will turn to the White House. And there was a, if you recall, Michelle Obama walked out of a room in some, it was a video link, surrounded by soldiers, and she opened the card on video link and announced that Argo was the winner of Best Picture. Now, to Iranians, this confirms what the student had said to me, that Hollywood and the White House were, in fact, really part of the same game. And I just had this moment of thinking that, you know, there are certain stories we tell ourselves that can be challenged from a certain direction. Um, and that official imprimatur of, with this militaristic kind of, the first lady coming surrounded by uniformed soldiers announcing that Argo had won, to Iranians who were very offended by that film was a very unfortunate moment. And that's a good example of how culture and geopolitics quite directly overlapped at that moment. Or let's put it this way, if Iranian cinema is known to be one of the great world cinemas, at least among cinephiles, if you were happened to be watching the equivalent of the Academy Awards in Iran, and at that moment Mahmoud Ahmadinejad awarded the best picture or you know you would you think that Iranian cinema is a part of the political machinery the way you know you would no. <laughs> so it's an interesting yeah uh, okay well, I have to go to people who haven't asked the question yet first this may, um, yeah. you may disagree with this but it, good this was, such, this was such an injury to the American uh, culture if you want to say uh, people at the time of the takeover of the embassy uh -huh. I mean this is like unheard of to have our embassy taken over and our people in prisons or held sure, for course. such a long time and the humiliation to Carter, you know. So I would think, because I'm kind of familiar with the, uh, 
a Middle Eastern mentality, which is very tuned into injury and insult and humiliation. So I would think, in a sense, that the people who are so critical of this film would understand that this is a way to recover. You know, the film is saying there, there were ways that we could deal with this injury. We could get our people out. You know, that was it was a very profound time in the United States. That was broadcast all the time. The prisoners, you know, with blindfolds on, completely impotent. You know, so I, mean, I think that, the, that given their mentality, their psychology. Digging a little deeper, I think they could empathize with that. Probably not on a political level, but on a psychological level. Well, one thing I would say, the way you posed it, yeah. um, is that I wouldn't feel comfortable with the idea that there is a Middle Eastern mentality that yeah. is, in itself, would explain political history in psychological terms. We have done that a lot, yeah. right? Um, there's great traditions of doing that, um, and it it seems to be a dead end. Certainly individuals, I mean, when I think about the response to September 11th, for example, the way that public discussion in the United States about the, another terrible event, obviously, my father was in the World Trade Center, 77th floor, um, that morning. was in the World Trade Center? Yeah, that morning, yeah, 77th floor. Oh, so wow. I know this quite well when I say this, that, um, that the discussion after September 11th of what, um, what we should all be feeling was not, and how we should react on, as a result of those f aggrieved feelings. Not everybody feels the same way. Um, or I wouldn't say that there is a mentality that I leads to action, but that, those emotions it, were, yeah. I'm not putting yeah. it down, I yeah. think respect Self-esteem yeah. and non-humiliation are very important in the Arab culture. I think mm -hmm. that's very important. I think it's accurate, you know, what I'm saying. Maybe mm -hmm. that doesn't apply well, to Well, of course, body. Iran is not Arab. Well, whatever. I can say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, unfortunately, then, we don't have to have... So, unfortunately, it's not relevant, Arab culture, to the case of Iran. I mean, so this... I mean, but I'm, I, I hear what you're, you're saying. That's one part of what you're saying. The other part of what you're saying is that is that, I think, that cultural events, such as a popular award-winning film, allow us to rethink his historical emotions. And I did feel, I think, to put it in a different way, that in Walking, I actually saw that film in Evanston, and I was struck at a filled theater, as maybe you felt it saw it here too, with a lot of people who certainly, just by visual look, remembered firsthand oh, yeah. You know, the age of the people. I mean, I remember this, so about people who were older than me. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was an audience that did not have a lot of young people in it. Mm -hmm. And I felt, actually, during the film, including in the beginning that I'm talking about, that there was something very interesting happening in the theater as people relived certain emotions. Now, one could say, and I won't talk about this for much longer, that the way that, the way that we, of course, experienced those 444 days was also the technical word, the mediated experience, was, was, a, was an experience that we shared collectively through a media, through the media, right? This is, I mean, if we think about the various wars that we've all remember, however young or old we are in the room, each of the wars, um, certainly back to World War II, have been understood, and, you know, hostage crisis is not a war, but I mean, each of these wars and major events have been understood through changing media technologies. Right? World War II was, for example, you know, newsreels and cine cinema was the way that we, as well as lots of journalism, but it was the, and radio was the way that we kind of got this through one technology, just to jump through several wars. Vietnam as the first kind of television war. The first, the 1991 war in Iraq as the first cable news war. And we talked about the first internet war. Now we talk about kind of streaming media events and so on. And so, the way, this is not to minimize the pain of the individual people involved, people who killed in wars or killed on September 11th and so on, but the way the rest of us who make the history that follows and that uses those events, and you, I don't mean use, that, that makes use of collective, emotional, effective responses to major world calamities, wars, holocausts, genocides, right? 
There's always use being, you know, how do we work through them? Media has a really, the way that media tells those stories and frames our own collective emotions is not unimportant to them. So what you remember about, and what I remember and what many of us remember about the hostage crisis, of course, was a media event too. And the way that the media, and there's been a lot of really interesting scholarship about that media coverage in media studies. Edward Said wrote a whole book about it, actually. It's a very interesting book. Um, and about how we start to come up with ideas that, you know, there's a collective Iranian or Arab or Muslim way of being. There's no Psychology. one way of Muslim. Psychology. Yeah, but there's a billion Muslims. There's not one Muslim psychologist. Of course. But you <laughs> right. uh, yeah. talk about right. it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, well, yeah, I, yeah, I just no. wanted to say something about Argo. I've mentioned him so much, he got it. You know. yeah. Argo, um, no, I, it's, if you put aside that it insulted people and it did various things that were not really a good idea, but if you put that aside and say, okay, it's just a fiction, just a story, it was actually a dumb movie. <laughs> and that gets lost. Huh. I, when it got the Academy Award for Best Picture, I was disgusted because there were good movies that year. And here we had this stupid thing. I, I thought it was like Lincoln was one of the competition. You might watch late at night, yeah. but I, now I give it two and a half stars. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a dumb movie, and that chase at the end yeah, is right. not only silly; it wouldn't be possible. Yeah. Somebody wants to stop a plane from taking off; they don't have to chase it in a three star. Right? <laughs> right as the plane hits, like, hits the air, they clink the drinks or something like that. Yeah. It, it was just it's interesting how form, I mean, I want to let you have the last question because you're the first one, um, but the, yeah, I mean, it, the formulas that Argos as a film kind of summons, um, you know, becomes, you know, and this is something that Holly, that Ben, and he knows how to do it, Ben Affleck, is why he was successful in this film in part, because he could bring on formulas that we recognize, including the chase scene, yes. it's impossible, but we are... I, yeah. I said it was a Dukes of Hazard. I actually said it advisedly because I think he was playing with 1970s. There's a lot of ways in which he was playing with 1970s formulas in this sort of interesting way, that um, including this television show that I grew up watching, probably while I was watching Changing the Channel to the Hostage Crisis and change it to the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> Another thing that I would want to... People were really upset, I remember, with, with the hostage crisis. Almost nobody realizes what we did in Iran, and okay, they finally, in Iran, right. Iran there's just no doubt about it. The right. Americans organized the coup right. that brought back the king right. that had been legitimately eliminated, right. brought him back, set him up, supported him, so that he was our man. Yeah. And, and that, this is great. <laughs> yeah. And then you can tell a story about, I'm not, not you know, that, that, you know, Muslims are a certain way, they hold grudges, or they feel shame. Mm -hmm. um, and those very, sometimes very weakly constructed psychologies have more descriptive power than the idea that the Iranians had actually, you know, that the rise of the Shahs, you know better, you could give this lecture better than I could, you know, comes from one of the most um, uh, harsh forms of colonialism that the British had, in setting up the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, otherwise known as British Petroleum, otherwise known as BP, right on the corner of, uh, of McCormick and Dempster. Um, and my daughter, every time I shop there for gas, she says, but you said you would boycott that forever after reading Stephen Kinzer's book about what the British did to, you know, and the, and the Shahs that rise to keep that business relationship going, all before the Americans get involved, right? And Alan Dulles, well, but right. we, we came in and took credit for it. Yeah, we it took really so it's a very well, interesting in thing. Well, in terms of the Cold War and certain other sort of ignorances at the time, removing most of it made sense to some people, but it was really a terrible thing to do. Well, it's what we're Professor Kinzer calls uh, blowback. You know that there's so again. I'm not just to understand. I'm not and I, and please don't misunderstand. I'm not justifying any historical actions. Terrible things. These are all terrible things we're talking about. But what I'm giving this example a bit quickly probably for is that historical narratives and the stories we do or we don't tell about historical events and how we interpret them become the things that we remember and the things that allow us and cultural here we're talking about a very traditional cultural form of hollywood film of about two hours in length a feature film that has a 
form, any film, any watcher of film knows that we are used to have certain expectations about the arc of a film, ways that stories resolve, characters that, these are, these are the, this is literature and film, and yet somehow we're talking about the historical truth here. And Ben Affleck is telling you explicitly that he knows and that this is the truth. So that when any president, Democrat or Republican says, or Marco Rubio says, we don't just have superior arms, we have superior aims, mm -hmm. and we will export freedom, we will export democracy, they will be carrying roses to greet our soldiers, right? And the, and the scholars or the people who actually have, or the people from the region say, I don't really think so. They say, no, it will be that way. And we will act on that. How much have we lost and spent on this? Trillions? Right? When we're cutting, when, how much does it cost to send your kid to public school, public college, right? So, I mean, this is something that now people are getting pretty angry about. But, you know, I'm making now so it sound like a conspirator, conspirator over here myself, and I'm on line eventually on this, so that's a bad thing. <laughs> you include the Q&A. <laughs> I just have more of a cultural criticism question, and that is that in your discussion of Shrek, and also to some extent of American hip-hop, yeah. crossing into different other cultures, boy, that word's becoming an issue, isn't it? It seems like it's also morphing from form to content as it crosses those boundaries. Mm. So when I think of Shrek, I think of a piece of content, the form is CGI animation, but it sounds like in Iran, a Shrek is almost more of a form, with multiple kinds of content that's infused into it. Well, that's a really interesting question. I actually think that he, that some of the, that the form and the content are not so separate in the original incarnation of these things, too. Mm -hmm. um, that, that some of what we think of when we think of Shrek here, or some of these films, is if we call the form not just the CGI illustration, but the special effects, Star Wars, you know, these things that... It's not only about the, the story and the plot and the characters, but something about the look um, and, the, and the technology and the effects and so on, um, the cinematography. I mean, we can... Um, but what's interesting in the case of these morphing or recoded or circulating, the word I like more in a way, um, versions of a film like Shrek, is that something about this technology allows for users to make their own art in a way that's almost unpredicted. I mean, really what I'm interested in, right? So you could always do this. You could always take, I mean, there, you know, our colleague Hamid Nafisi has written wonderfully about the history of Iranian dubbing. I mean, in between, he's got this four volume book on the history of Iranian cinema. He talks about dubbing every so often because there's this great tradition of dubbing in Iran. It's actually a new book a guy was just telling me about. One of our colleagues at NUQ who's writing on history of dubbing in Iran. It's a fascinating story, pre-digital, right? But now, and a lot of the things that I'm interested in in this book, you know, some only mildly talented person can take a digital film and put things together in such a way and create a new work with a lower threshold mm -hmm. than what it used to take. Or, um, and this is again media studies or digital media studies, people can have a voice and have access to a, a large audience. This goes back to Joe's comment in a way before, I think, um, more easily the, the barrier to say something, let's say through Twitter or various forms of publication, where you could have a larger audience than used to be the case when I was coming out of college. You have to, how did you get thousands or millions of people to read you? You'd have to break into the New York Times, but you couldn't do that, right? So now, S somewhat savvy people can find ways to have a large audience and and that's again te technology driven too so I mean we're kind of going between form and content what do they do with that <laughs> right could be the content but then we would say that something about the form uh, changes the content this is actually the debate that's going today and yesterday around Calvin Trillin's very old-fashioned 1980s kind of poem that is somehow tone deaf to the fact that you could quickly, so Calvin Trillin wrote a poem, published in the New Yorker last week or this week, last, last, week, twice. last week, but only yesterday did people notice it in a certain kind of way, and then yesterday it went crazy, it went everywhere, and then today several, po several 
critics and Asian American studies scholars and a wonderful poet friend of mine at the University of Wisconsin grew up in Wilmette. Uh, Timothy Yu wrote a poem, satirizing poems that themselves then went viral, kind of rewriting, like, you know, publishing within the hour, you know, or writing it and then publishing it minutes after they, and then it could reach, within minutes of publication, tens of thousands of people. Now, the content is important here, but the form constructs something of the way the content will move. I mean, actually, the poem, I gave the wrong example, because the po sat satirical poem back was actually an old form. That was the problem with Trellin's thing. He used an old form, doggerel. But the 140-character tweet, right, or the, the Facebook post in which the form and the content actually are interrelated, you can't tell a story over 140 characters without letting the form somehow affect the content. Those of you who know how to do it, you know, it's hard to do, right? Um, so it starts to get a bit scrambled even in its first moment. It's a great question.